Thank you. Oh, can you all hear me? I'm double mic'd up. I'm a, I'm a little unsure at hearing my own voice coming back at me. So if anyone in the room thinks I'm speaking too loudly or too quietly, you can tell me. As Chris said earlier, I'm really happy for people to put their hands up or ask questions. Um, someone earlier, one of the students here, um, when we were sitting at the front before we began, asked me, said, are you nervous? And I said, well, kind of, actually. And now after all the talks that have just happened, I really am, because I know you're going to put me to the test. Because this is a really, uh, fun I mean, it's a real honor for me to be here talking to all of you. And I, I really, I really mean that. And when I was invited, uh, it was quite a few months ago now, I thought, oh, that's probably going to be the hardest thing I'm going to have to do all year. Because uh, you're, you guys are on it, and you're interested. And, you know, it's, it's quite easy talking to sort of parent age and grandparent age. You give them some nice movies. You tell them that it's cold and it's beautiful. And then they go away feeling all good about it. And, you know, sometimes you slip in a little bit about climate change, but not too much. And it's, it's, it's good for me, because then I can only ever stay within the threshold of what I actually know. So I have a feeling I'm going to be going outside my comfort range over this lecture and the next one, which is fine. And I invite you to go outside of your comfort range and ask me questions, and I may well not know the answer, but if that is the case, then I will seek the answer and I'll get back to you. So, uh, so we'll just see how we go. Um, so I've come to talk to you about, can you all see, where do you want me? I know there's cameras and things around, okay. Just, you know, move me where I need to go. I've, I've come to talk to you about the, the, the international polar year and the polar regions, just out of interest. How many of you have even heard of the International Polar Year? Oh, quite a few. See, you already know a lot more than most of the public audiences I might have talked to. That's great. So um, we might spend a bit of time today actually just finding out what you know already before we go on and, and tell you what we think you might be interested in. Um, but as was just mentioned, uh, I just thought I'd tell you a bit about who I am. My name's Rian. I did live in Antarctica for a year and a half. I was working as an atmospheric chemist, um, which means I was taking a lot of measurements of the air and of the air in the snow and trying to understand the transfer processes between them. And I'll tell you a bit about that and why I was doing that later on. And um, my clicker isn't working. There we go. Uh, I now work for the International Polar Year, as was mentioned, and that's what we're going to spend a lot of time, not just today, but over the next couple of weeks, I hope you're going to learn a lot about both the Arctic and the Antarctic and the wide amount of science that is being carried out in these regions, as well as how they are relevant to um, the rest of the world. So actually, I'm going to break already five minutes in with the general outline of how lectures run, because I'm quite interested to know what you know. And I'd be really interested if you could, I think most of you got pads of paper in front of you. If you could just write down, you're going to keep this with you for the next two weeks. Write down these three columns about, about the, the Arctic and the Antarctic. What do I know? What do I want to know? And what did I learn? And right now, we're just going to focus on the what do I know. Maybe at the end of this lecture, we'll spend a bit of time saying what I want to know so that you can put those of us who are trying to bring you information to work to try and deliver what you're interested in. And at the end, it would be great if at the end of these two weeks you, you go back to this table and, and have a think about what you learnt. And if any of you would like to write up your experience of your, your ISS experience here, especially with, related to the International Polar Year, then I will publish those on the International Polar Year web along with any photos you might have. So if you could write me a, a story of what you did and what you learnt and what you liked and what you didn't, then uh, in a couple of weeks' time we'll, we'll pop that up as a, as a, a, a token of what, all, all of you, what you've been learning here. So just take a couple of minutes just writing down anything you can think of about the Arctic or the Antarctic. Just, just for now, just for now, write down... Just We're going we're gonna to talk to each other in a second. Just for now, write down five things. Just off the top of your head. Bam, 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 bam. I'm going to give you 30 seconds more. So, what I would like to now do is I'm going to split this room roughly in half that way. So people on this side are going to think about the Arctic. And the people on this side are going to think about the Antarctic. 
And this time, feel free to turn to the people next to you, the people in front of you, behind you. And I want you to... No? Sorry. There we go. I want you to now talk about yourselves just on the one thing which you're, which, which you're focusing on, either on the Arctic, on this side, or the Antarctic, as a group. Write down the things that you can think of, and then in about four minutes' time, we're just going to write them up on the board, because it'd be good to know what you already know. Arctic, Antarctic, talk amongst yourselves. The more noise, the better. I would encourage the, uh, the older students in the room to walk around and talk to the younger students as well and share what you know, to find out what they're talking about. Keep talking, Arctic, Antarctic. All right. Oh, you know a lot. So there's some people over here who stopped talking and they said that they've written down everything they know about the Arctic and the Antarctic. Is it, are there other people who still need more time? Because you know so much already. <laughs> You're right. Okay, well, why don't we just see what we know already? It's good to know where we're at. Who, which side did we, who, uh, let's start with the Antarctic. Who wants to just shout out some stuff that you know about the Antarctic? Up there, there's a hand. There's a great hole over the Antarctic. What is, what's that, what, do you want to give it a name? The ozone hole, okay, great. And what about something about the Arctic? <laughs> Polar bears. There was another one here. I was, I was just going to say, all these like bridges between the land masses in the winter. That way, that's how it has polar bears. Ah, good. F forms ice ice ridges between the land masses. Between the land ice bridges. Yeah. yeah, which is why the polar bears, how the polar bears can get around. Great. <laughs> and <laughs> Antarctic. Okay, we've got three. One, two, three. Really unique biodiversity. Great. The Antarctic is on a continental shelf which actually slowed down because it's got so much ice on it. Yeah, great. So the Antarctic is on a continental shelf which, which is slowed down, is slowed down ice because ice there's so much ice on it. It's actually, there's actually two, uh, two plates in the Antarctic, the East Antarctic and the West Antarctic. And, and I'll see if I can find you a... I might put that into tomorrow's lecture. You'll be able to see how they how they formed. That's that's great. There was another one up here for the Antarctic. So great. The ice in, in Antarctica um, contains uh, indications of, of carbon dioxide over past over the many many years, right? And so that, that's in ice cores. We'll talk a bit about that then as well, maybe. Okay, what about the Arctic? There's a big hand here. Eskimos. Eskimos. <laughs> that's a very good point. There's a lot of people who live in the Arctic, who, 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 who this is their natural home where they've lived for many, many thousands of years, unlike in the Antarctic, which has just mainly got, got researchers down there. It's a very good point. It's a very big part of... The International Polar Year is what life is like in the Arctic and how it's changing at the moment. There's another one for the Arctic here. No, here, and then we'll come to you. It's, it's just a big mass of ice. The Arctic is a big mass of ice, so you can go under it. There's a really good point. The Arctic is ocean. And Santa And Santa Claus. <laughs> you might, might want to put that one there. <laughs> good point. <laughs> It's a very good point here that the, the Arctic is, uh, is, is ocean and the Antarctic is a continent. Santa! Where's he going to live if the ice melts? He's going to have to move to the South Pole. Um, there was another Arctic one here, yes, yeah, sorry. the animals are starting to change their behavior because of the melting of ice in the Arctic. That is true. I don't know whether you're Arctic or Antarctic. You're right in the middle. That's fair enough. Yeah, there's a lot of similarities as well.
Yeah, that's great. So the, did you get that? The ionosphere? Well, it's Arctic and Antarctic. The ionosphere and the solar, the solar wind that comes around. And you know, the auroras, that, that's what you're talking about. So you've got the aurora australis and the aurora borealis. And actually, there's a big project um, in, in IPY, which is looking, I think this is really cool. They're looking at how the auroras in the northern hemisphere and in the southern hemisphere, they, they kind of dance together. They move around at the, you know, in the, the, same, the same way. It's really cool. So they're studying the Arctic and the Antarctic and watching how the, how the same sort of very similar looking auroras happen in both hemispheres. And that tells you a lot about, how, about global linkages that we didn't know about before. Okay, are there any other burning things you want to talk about? There was, oh, yeah, there are. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really good one, permafrost in the Arctic. For those of you who don't know, permafrost is, is the frozen soil in the, because bear in mind, okay, the Antarctic does have a lot of ice and snow on top of the, the land, but perm, in the Arctic, there's a lot of land in the top level which, is, which freezes and melts, and below that there's a sort of permanently frozen layer. But with, in the last number of years, that, that, that frozen layer is melting, and as a result, there is, there's methane trapped there, which is getting released. That's a climate, uh, um, a greenhouse gas. But also, it means that the land which people have been living on is becoming unstable. So houses are falling down. There's some really practical problems with permafrost melting. Great, that's a really good one. Yes? Sorry? Yeah, that's a good, but this is how, this is how um, uh, the carving, as in C-A-L-V-I-N-G, the carving of, of ice sheets and icebergs and, and, and glaciers, and how actually water doesn't just melt off the surface, but sometimes it melts down into the ice, and then as a result, suddenly a whole amount, big amount of ice can just kind of go flying off. And that's relevant in both the Arctic and the Antarctic. What I should have done, you're all, you see, you are pushing me. I should have had Arctic, Antarctic, and both, because there's a, there's a whole lot of issues which are relevant to both, and it's also important to think about the differences. Okay, we're going to, I know you've got more things there, and you're going to hopefully write them down on your piece of paper. I'll take five more, because I know there's a load of hands out there. Okay, one, two, oh, I'll take a few more then. Three, four, five, six. Okay. <laughs> well, that was difficult. That's a, that's a great one. That, that's a really great one. It's, so permanent night and permanent day. We might just have one here that said that's called both, even though we should have done that from the beginning. But you can keep it up there as well, because it's relevant to both. So, and that's true. Where I was living in Antarctica, the uh, sun stayed below the horizon for 105 days. But you know, you know there's something interesting here is people think it's night all the time or it's day all the time. But actually, it's, it's not like that. It was, I mean, for me, the winter was the most amazing time because actually, even though the sun's below the horizon, for the first week or two, it's not very far below the horizon, so you just have these continual sunsets and sunrises. It's stunning. You watch the kind of the light moving around the horizon like this. It's amazing, and the same happens in the Arctic. So you get the most gorgeous colors, especially like where I was was just a flat ice shelf for as far as you could see. So the colors, the pinks and the reds, and it's a really special time. And to watch the stars moving overhead, two o'clock in the afternoon, watching, you know, I used to watch Orion move, and then I'd watch uh, Scorpio chasing him around the sky. It was great. Okay, that's a, that's a really nice one. Um, and then, of course, the same is true in the, in the summer when the sun never sets and you can't sleep. So who's number two? Yeah, there's supposedly a lot of natural resources under the Antarctic continent because the continent used to be near the equator. There were rainforests there, so there would be lots of oil and coal. Oh, that's a really good one. Natural resources. That's an Antarctic one, I think, specifically there. And that touches on plate tectonics and how and you know geology geomorphology it's a really good point and natural resources and this touches on economics 
and politics as well as, so, and, and how the science relates to economics and politics in both the Antarctic and the Arctic. You might want to say natural resources there, but there's also a, a lot of, where's the, uh, you're the Arctic one here, there's a lot of hydrocarbons under the Arctic Ocean in the north which have not been accessible. But if the ice melts, then uh, there's a potential there for, for drilling oil. That's a really good point. So this is, a, this is touching on, on reasons why how uh, the Arctic and the Antarctic uh, affect us. Um, there, well, there, I'm, I'm losing the plot here. I'm getting carried away with each one. One, two, three, four, five, six, there was. You're number three, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. The, the ocean, this was a both one, I think. The ocean currents, the, uh, the, the way the whole ocean circulation system works, I mean, it takes about a thousand years to get all the way around the, the, the planet, but the Arctic and the Antarctic are key places for the sinking of water, because for the water to sink, it has to be really dense. And for it to be dense, do you know what the two things are for, to make really dense water? Salt and cold, yeah. So that's where you get the saltiest, coldest water, and it drives the whole circulation system. And if, if, if you were to, to dilute that by melting freshwater ice into it, then it would be less salty, or, and, and as a result, it might not sink, and the whole circulation system might change, and you're right. And people talk about global warming, but you know, quite potentially, there are definitely areas of the world, definitely Europe, where I come from in, in the UK, we've got the Gulf Stream. I mean, there's a, you know, that could get... If that got switched off, we'd go into a mini ice age. We wouldn't be calling it global warming. So, good point. Ocean currents. That was number three. Number four was over here somewhere. Who was number four? Okay, who was number five? You are, yes. Polar, the polar bear is, is potentially facing extinction, was that one? This is an Arctic one, because as the ice melts, they've got to swim further. There's some, there's some big issues here, and, you'll, and I really challenge you to ask all your lecturers during the next couple of weeks about the science behind this. Is it melting? How do you know it's melting? How quickly is it melting? Because there's an awful lot in the media, we hear the media a lot, and people, oh, the polar bear's going extinct, and oh, the world's going to heat up in two years. And, and there's a lot of very important science underlying a lot of this, but, but as was mentioned earlier, the media and environmental activism they really have an important place, but as scientists, we have to understand what the physical basis is, what the physical argument is, and understand that the mechanisms and what we do and don't understand. So it's a really good point, potential extinction of polar bears and uh, whether or not you know, this is a scientific basis or not. Hang on, you weren't number six. There was a number six over here. The Aurora. <laughs> ah, yes, the Aurora should be for the Antarctic and the Arctic. So we'll put it down as the both. You're quite right, yeah. Yes, there's an Aurora, and in fact, the aurora, which happens in the Arctic and the Antarctic, often they mirror each other. And you actually have really similar shapes. And across the, the, the uh, if you imagine the sort of the magnetic shape of the, of the Earth as opposed to the geographical, across the, the various polar regions, they, they match up. That's great. We've got an amazing amount of stuff here. There were two or three other desperate hands, and then we're going to move on. There was one here, and I think there was one back there. Is that right? There's, there, you know, you're, you're quite right. There were about three different but important points in there. The polar regions contain a lot of the world's fresh water. Polar regions do contain over 90% of the world's fresh water. That's really important. Okay, that in itself is an important one. The second one was, if they melt, they'll dilute the oceans, which kind of touches on what we were talking about before, that if they melt, they might change the salinity of the ocean. That could change the ocean circulation. So I think we've got that one. And the third was, if they melt, 
they'll dilute the oceans and the sea levels will rise. And actually, that is, that is true. You're adding an amount of water to the oceans. But one of the other reasons why people talk about sea level rise is because as, as the oceans warm up, they experience thermal expansion. And so they increase in volume and that volume. So actually, a lot of the sea level rise is partially due to potential contribution from Greenland or Antarctica, but it's also due to you know, things taking up more space when they're warm. I, I, I'm not even going to give my lecture. You guys know it all. <laughs> OK. No, two more, and then I'm going to move on. There's one here, and there was one there. The, in the Antarctic, it's floating ice, did you say, or in the Arctic? In the Antarctic, Yeah, that's a good point. So the, the ice in Antarctica, again, there's a couple of good points here. The ice in Antarctica is on land. It's, it's, not on, it's not in the ocean. And so if it melts, it will contribute to the amount of water in the oceans. There's another interesting point here is there's so much ice in Antarctica that it's actually pushing the land below, below sea level. And so if that ice melts, you're also going to have this sort of repercussion effect, which can also have impl has implications on the effect on the oceans. And the second point was that the, the ice in the Arctic is floating. And so you know how if you, if you get an ice cube and, and it melts, the water level in the glass doesn't rise, right? It just stays the same. The same goes for true. If you have floating icebergs, for instance, and it's not going to, it might change the salinity, but it's not going to change the sea level. But in, in large amounts of Alaska and Canada and Greenland and northern Russia, there are a lot of glaciers which are melting. So they, they are on land. But it's a really good point. A lot of people don't appreciate the difference between ice that's already floating. And you often see, this is another thing in the media, you often see photos of icebergs melting. And people go, oh, the icebergs are melting. And you see, your sea level is going to change. And you go, no, it's not. It's just melting. <laughs> you know, I mean, other things might change. But, so it, that's a really good point. Was that all the desperate hands? Great, OK. You, the other rest of you can speak in a minute, I promise. We just wanted to get an idea of, oh, what happened to, what happened to my, I never even put them up there. Hello. Oh, that's what I wanted you to talk about. So you've done that. Let's see if we can get this clicker to work. How does the place, I just, I was, the second thing I was going to ha have you think about there for a minute, maybe we'll do this later on, we'll just, is how does the place affect me and where I live? And you've actually touched on this quite a lot already. So rather than talking amongst yourselves, I think we can, we can already look at the ones which are here. We've talked already about sea level rising. We've talked about ocean currents. Um, let's see what's going on here. Let's see, how do I move this up? There we go. Um, people, we talked about people living in the Arctic and culture. Santa, that's going to affect how we live if there's no Santa. <laughs> what about in the Antarctic? The ozone hole, I think we all know that, that actually, does, especially people who live in Australia, the ozone hole is a, re a real reality. Biodiversity, <coughs> natural resources, oil and gas. So there's this idea that the polar regions, some people think they're very far away and they don't matter, but I think you've all actually, just in your answers, already shown that that you know, the polar regions have a, have a day-to-day -day impact on us because the processes, processes which are happening there are determining our climate, such as the ocean circulation system that, that, that feeds into the atmospheric circulation system, that affects the weather that we experience, and also, as you were, you were talking about, about potential sea level rising, potential uh, melting of the ice caps, and, and also... Uh, Culturally, you know, it might, it might affect some of you more than others. So just, I just want you to keep in mind throughout the next couple of weeks as we, we talk about the polar regions, because it's really easy to get really carried away. Just always bring it back and try and think about how does it affect who I am, where I live, people who I, who I know at home. And we'll come back to that later. I'm struggling a bit with my clicker here. I might... Let's see if I've got two... I've got so many clickers... I'm going to click, switch to this one, see if that's any better. Okay. So, I've lost track of... Are we going till... 
criminal house. Twelve, 12. okay, great. You started a bit, bit late. Yeah, that's fine. So I just thought I'd do a little bit, tell you a little bit about the international polio after we found out what you knew. And tomorrow I'll tell you a whole lot more. Um, first, a little bit of history. I'm just going to stand over here. The first international polio year actually happened in 1882. It was the visionary of a guy called Carl Weyprecht. He, he was a naval officer and he realized that... Um, sorry, I just have to stand near my computer here. He, he realized that in order to study the Arctic, in order to understand what's happening in northern Greenland or northern Canada, you also have to understand processes that are happening in Russia. And these are some photos of uh, some of the buildings and some of the instrumentation that... Uh, that was used in the 1880s. So I just want you to have this feeling that actually polar science has been going on for a long time and polar years have been happening for a long time. And really, in order to understand what's going on in the polar regions, you have to have a whole diverse collection of, of, across both disciplines and countries. The second polar year uh, had 40 countries involved. Sorry, I, I didn't mention the first one had 11 different countries involved and went to both the Arctic and the Antarctic. That was in the 1930s. This was a really critical time for uh, meteorology, magnetism, jet stream. A lot of the communication science that we rely on today, that all came out of the second polar year. Um, and bear in mind that uh, this happened, sorry, having technological issues here. This happened between, if you think historically, it happened uh, between the Great Depression and the, and, one of the great, and one of the world wars. So economically, this was a hard time to do science, and still a huge amount of data came out of this. I'm just flying through this, just so I just wanted you guys to have a feel for the history of what we're getting involved in now. The third polar year, which is also known as the International Geophysical Year, is probably the most famous, and an awful lot of science, as we've heard, including the, the, the international science schools, started 50 years ago. Um, there were 67 nations involved, 50 Antarctic stations were established, there were traverses of Antarctica, there were, the first um, satellite was launched, uh, what else happened? There was discovery of Van Allen radiation belts, confirmation of the hypothesis of continental drift, as we know we're still talking about that now a bit. There were also political um, implications like uh, the Antarctic Treaty. How many of you have heard of the Antarctic Treaty? Oh, that's great. I mean, it's an amazing document. It dedicates an entire continent to peace and science. I mean, that's, and, and also uh, world data centers, this idea that actually if you really want to get good value for your science, you need to share your data. You need to talk to each other. You can't just go away, take some measurements, come home and write it up. There's no point in doing that. There's no point in us all going to these regions if we're not going to talk to each other. This is something I just wanted to show you. There was a booklet that came out in the International Geophysical Year that was talking about why they were doing the science. And they said, our industrial civilization has been pouring carbon dioxide into the atmosphere at a great rate. By the year 2000, we will have added 70% more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. So this was written 50 years ago. If it remained, it would have a marked warming effect on the Earth's climate, but most of it would probably be absorbed by the oceans. Conceivably, however, it could cause significant melting of the great ice caps and raise sea levels in time. So 50 years, this was written in 1958. We knew that we were increasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. We thought the oceans would absorb it all. We didn't think there'd be a problem. So really, a lot of the science that, that you guys now know of as sort of day-to-day -day stuff which you see in the media, it's very new. It's very new. And we're still learning about it. So that brings us now to the fourth international polar year. This is what I want to talk, what you're going to hear a lot about in the next couple of weeks. And the fourth international polar year actually lasts for two years. And the reason why it lasts for two years is because if you are a polar researcher, as we heard earlier, it's, it's night all the time and then it's day all the time and it's really hard to get to these places. You have to get there in the summer, set up, organize all your instruments, calibrate them, and then you have to leave them for the winter and sometimes you stay with them and sometimes you leave them to bury and you go back the following year in the summer and, and get your instruments back. You really need a summer, winter, summer to do a full year study. Does that make sense? And in order to give the Arctic and the Antarctic both a fair shot at it, which really is only fair, you need 
summer, winter, summer in the Arctic and summer, winter, summer in the Antarctic, the total amount of time is two years. So it's a bit confusingly named, but there's actually a good rationale for it. Now, I'm just fading this chart in because it's a bit dizzy making. You're not supposed to be able to read anything that's on there. This is a chart that we use to try and map out all the projects, all the science that's happening in the International Polar Year. There's an awful lot of stuff going on. What you, what I, the only thing I really want you to, um, oh, come on, to uh, notice with this is that each one of those hexagons represents one really big, really impressive international coordinated, cutting edge research project. In any other year, any one of those would make big, big news. And, and what is happening in the International Polar Year is anyone who's doing anything in the polar regions is coming together and doing it at the same time because the idea is we don't know everything that we want to know and we don't know what we need to know. And so if we all go together, chemists and physicists and biologists and astronomers and social scientists, and we go and study these regions at the same time, then when we get sort of outside the area which is our expertise, we'll hopefully find a colleague who, who, who has overlapping research interests who will be able to help us on our way of understanding the thing that we're looking into. So th that's the idea of this, this honeycomb chart. I'll just give you some statistics. Oh, a really important thing, and uh, yeah. So why are there unlike gaps in the map? Okay, I'll, sh I'll show you that. This, what we've got actually, I think there might be a pointer on one of these. What you can see on this chart, I forgot to talk you through it, sorry, was at the top is, is projects which broadly are looking at the Arctic. And at the bottom is projects which are broadly looking at the Antarctic. And in the middle are projects which are looking at both the Arctic and the Antarctic. A lot of these things that we were talking about here. So you can actually see what I was doing earlier here does fit into International Polar Year. And you already know a lot of the issues which are being looked at scientifically. And this actually began just with a few squares. I should show you the history of these charts. And then the squares filled up, and then there were too many, and they became sort of triangles, and then they became circles, and that didn't work, and now they've become hexagons. So this wasn't a top-down thing. This was kind of a bottom-up thing. And somebody might still come to us with a new project, and we'll try and figure out where it goes and pops it in. So this is actually a, a planning chart. And so the reason why they're gap, I mean, there are some very obvious gaps, is there's one big gap down here. You see that focus on, let me just, I think I put a circle around it in a minute. Oh, sorry. Oh, well, you get them as well. Anyway, you see, the, you see the big circle around people. There's a lot of people living in the Arctic, and there's a lot of people in the Arctic who are, who are the initiators of people-focused projects, looking at health issues, looking at reindeer herding, looking at language, looking at economics, looking at how the Arctic is changing. That actually doesn't happen in the Antarctic. There's not a great deal. There's one study in the Antarctic um, on people, and that's looking at at depression and light and dark and how Antarctic research is off. But other than that, there isn't a great deal of social science happening in the Antarctic. Whereas in the, Ant where in the Arctic, there's a huge amount of social science. So that's the reason for a lot of hexagons in the top and, and not in the bottom. And the other clear gaps are in the space area. And actually, we could have filled this whole area. But again, the reason one of these projects, which is on the right-hand side, is uh, actually... At the same time as the International Polar Year is something called the International Heliophysical Year. And that is one of these hexagons. And that itself is a whole other bunch of projects. But the reason why they're not on here is because definitely when you're looking at space, that's looking at both the Arctic and the Antarctic. So you've got big gaps in the Arctic and the Antarctic sections of the chart there just because all the projects really fit into the middle, which is the both category. And those are probably the two biggest, the biggest gaps. Does that, does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Are there other questions? Yeah. Um, on the hexagon to the left of 170 signs, it's in the book that it says aliens in Antarctica. Yes. And I was just wondering if I could do all the ways that Did you plant her? No. <laughs> the project leader of Aliens in Antarctica is coming to talk to you next week. Oh. And she's a fantastic woman called Dana. And Aliens in Antarctica is talking about... See, I said you're not supposed to be able to read that stuff. You know, I deliberately made it fuzzy. What that project is, it's a great project. It's looking at, at alien species as in um, it could be plants, it could be micro... 
organisms, it could be people, it could be animals, which have mo gone into Antarctica, which aren't native to Antarctica. And I believe she's going to turn up next week with a, literally with a vacuum cleaner and vacuum all of your clothes because she's really interested into, in, in seeds and spores that people carry on them, but tourists and researchers that people carry on them but when they go to Antarctica. And so she's actually, you, you guys are going to be the first sample of her massive IPY project, which is a collection of international people who, you know, totally not deliberately might happen to have on your shoes or in the cuffs of your clothes a seed. And if you were to now go to Antarctica, that could get there. And so that's what that project's about. This, that, not that I know of, no. I'm sorry for that. But it's still a cool project. <laughs> yeah, we've got to do that mass media science. We've got to work on that one, I think. There are I'm never going to, you know, hour-long presentation, you should have said 10 minutes and take the rest for questions. Um, that be related to a fighting they found in, I think, George Belinda and the meteorite from space, and they found some bacteria or something? Could, it could be. You, could, you should ask her. You should definitely ask her. That would, it, meteorites in Antarctica, are they aliens? That's a good question. They are, yeah. Some of them have been there for a very long time. I mean... You know, we are all stardust. You're getting into some pretty deep philosophical stuff there. Let me just, let me just go two more slides. Okay, go on, go on. Um, I was just wondering why you say um, that there were more projects on the Arctic than the Antarctic when there's the pressing matter of the sea level rise of the Arctic Ocean. There's pressing matters in both the Arctic and the Antarctic. The truth is, I wouldn't say that there's more projects. Some of these projects have, as I said, this is our planning chart. I don't show it to everyone, but I thought you guys might be interested in it which you are, apparently. <laughs> it doesn't, the size of a project, is, the size of a hexagon isn't related to the number of people in it. So there might be you know, 10 or 20 project leaders in one. There might be 100 project leaders. And the reality of the Antarctic is that research there is generally carried out by big national operators, by the British Antarctic Survey, by the Australian Antarctic Division, by the Na National Science Foundation. You know, the, these are big, and so they might put one hexagon on there for a large amount of activities. Whereas in the Arctic, you've got a lot of community-led projects. A lot of, you know, we, we talk about the researchers, the icebreakers and the canoes, which is that, you know, you could go to the Arctic or the Antarctic in an icebreaker and do amazing science and spend billions of dollars and tell the world and have a big multimedia campaign. But there might be someone else who's just kind of canoeing around who can get into places that that icebreaker can't get into. And we don't say no to anyone. The point is if the science is good, and that's if the science is evaluated. So you might actually find in the Arctic, and, and also there's this people aspect. You can see a lot of the Arctic ones are focused on people issues. So I don't think there's more in the Arctic than in the Antarctic. I think it's just the way that, that this particular chart is, is presenting it. Yeah. Because of logistics. I mean, the Arctic people live in the Arctic. You can get to the Arctic year-round, and a lot of the research comes from the Arctic. Whereas the Antarctic, to get there, you need ships, you need planes. I'm sorry, the question, for those of you who didn't hear, was why do you, need, why do you rely on large national operators to get to the Antarctic rather than the Arctic? And it's, it's mainly to do with logistics and safety. Okay, I'm going to just do two more slides here. <laughs> I'm going to just rewrite, I know, exactly, rewrite my talk for tomorrow and just continue. All I was going to tell you... <laughs> Is that it's going to go through this chart and say, you know, we've got just a, a taste of things that are happening in the polar year. This is reindeer herding in the Arctic. A lot of people who live there, sorry? Santa Claus. Santa Claus. I haven't put him on there, you know. He doesn't fit within the scientific mandate of my talk. The auroras who we've talked about, I mentioned earlier. There's a big study of, of uh, there's a big census of marine life happening. Ice, sh ice, sh ice shelves carving, we talked about that earlier. Um... Um, weather observations. This is someone launching an ozone sun from northern Sweden. Plates and gates. This was touched on earlier. This is, this is a, a, a rock that was found in Antarctica. You can see very clearly it's a fossil of a leaf. As the person you mentioned earlier, that because of due to plate tectonics, um, Antarctica didn't used to be where Antarctica is now. And there's a big study called Plates and Gates, which is looking at how it formed and looking at, and I mean, at that point, you know, this is the only place where the ocean, where you have a whole ocean that goes around the world and goes around a continent. Um, we can look at that tomorrow as well. Um, there's also a lot of people looking at history, history of exploration, 
um, lives in Antarctica. This is a friend of mine who's a diver. He lives in Antarctica holding a starfish. What's it like to live down there? Oh, whoa, what just happened then? That didn't want to show you that. We just jumped a whole about 20 slides. It's all right, they weren't all for today. <laughs> I might just um, stand here and click it. So we've done our reindeer and our auroras and our, our beasties. Where are we at? This guy with the starfish. And, and also people living in the Arctic. This girl, she's great. She, uh, she, her dad's a, a fisherman. And he's also a captain of a ship. And there was a, a researcher from the States who goes to northern Russia. She lives in, in, in Siberia. And he goes there to take samples of the Lena River. And this is really important uh, data for him. But he can only get there every six months. And on one of the trips when, she went there, when he went there, she was on the ship because her dad was the captain of the ship. And now, and she got really into the science, and now every two weeks she goes out with her dad and she takes samples from these rivers. And then he comes up, the scientist comes over every six months and collects the samples and analyzes them. They've now got her whole school involved. They've got the whole school board involved. They've got the whole area involved. It's amazing. So we've really, you know, it's really about people getting involved with the science as well. And there's also a lot of education and outreach and, and projects for students such as yourselves. So one of the things I was going to ask you to do, but maybe you can do this this evening, well, just, or just when you're kind of walking along amongst yourselves because we've got other things to talk about, is just to spend a bit of time thinking about those different areas that we were talking about. And I, th I, d I got carried away with the chart because we were talking. You might remember the chart was was split broadly into different disciplines, atmosphere, ice, space, land, oceans. And I just, I wanted you to take a minute to, um, let's finish at 12, right? Yeah. To, um, to think about these different disciplines, space, atmosphere, ocean, people, earth and land, and ice. And just think about um, what are the questions why would I want to investigate this discipline? Why specifically in the Arctic or the Antarctic? What is of interest with this particular area? And then secondly, how would I carry out this research? So what I was going to say was to talk amongst yourselves, because I thought you might all be quite shy. <laughs> but you're obviously not. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to cut that bit of the program. And just, just, I just want one, I want, I'm going to take two answers on each of these, two answers on each of these and number two. So we're going to start, for instance, with space. And I want just two things on why would I, what might you be interested in space? Anyone? Back there, yeah. How space affects the polar caps. Do you think space affects the polar caps? It might. Okay. Gravitational pull of the sun. Yeah. Global warming and tides. Okay. I think I said I'd take two, and I'm already taking about six. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna. I just. It's good to get you thinking about these things because we're gonna move on. How would you carry out research into space? I was thinking more about. Yeah. Satellites. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is. That's great. Yeah, that's really great. Now, space isn't. It's a difficult one. I started with a difficult one because space isn't in the polar regions, and why would you do it? But space, the polar regions are a fantastic vantage point for space because you can get 24 hours of nighttime for six months of the year, and that's just an astronomer's dream. So there's an, there are some amazing labs which are set up, so some am amazing equipment, telescopes. There's a, there's a huge a new neutrino telescope that's being, being built in Antarctica at the moment, which, which actually points downwards. It points into the ground and in, through the ice and catches the neutrinos as they come up at you. It's, it's a bit crazy. It's fantastic. So that's one of the things, the kind of ideas that people are looking at with space and, what, and how you'd work there. You'd, you'd, use, you'd set up You'd set up satellites, you'd use satellites, you'd set up telescopes. Let's go to atmosphere. What kind of questions might you be looking at for the atmosphere? The circulation and convection of air through the poles and throughout the world. 
Yeah, brilliant. Atmospheric circulation, spot on. That's, that's really critical and, and how it's driven at the polar regions. Yes? Ozone def density is definitely an atmospheric thing. It's happening in the atmosphere. Yeah, it's a really interesting one. Yep. How can you use the ice caps? Yeah, ice core science. Yeah, exactly. That's great. And how would I carry out research into the atmosphere? Can you see I'm getting more into my comfort zone because I'm an atmospheric scientist? <laughs> I could just stay here all day. There was one back there. Balloons? Yep, that's great. Spectrophotometers, yep. Yep. By taking the ice core samples. Taking ice core samples. Yep, fantastic. Yep. So that's, that's, that's a really good point. I, I guess the point I'm trying to make here is, you know, there's a lot of science and there's a lot of different techniques. Um, what we've done, atmosphere, what about people? People. What kind of questions might you be asking about people? How will rising sea level affect people around the world? Yep. How are the coexist with a fragile ecosystem? How can, yeah, how can you live in the Arctic with the ecosystem changing? One here. How does changing um, atmosphere and climate conditions affect the people that live in the area? Yeah, did you hear that? How atmosphere and climate conditions changing is, ha is affecting people there. This is a really good point. The health of people in the Arctic is changing quite a lot at the moment. The health because uh, a lot of pollutants are carried through atmospheric circulation and through ocean circulation and ending up inside a lot of the creatures which they hunt and eat. So, th so there's a big study on human health in the Arctic. One more here. Yes. Yeah. Who will be affected most? A lot of the indigenous communities in the Arctic who live primarily from seal hunting. There's a large health. We can touch on that one tomorrow as well. Okay. And the second question is how would... I know there were hands. I'm deliberately ignoring you. How, <laughs> how would I carry out research in this area? It's a tricky one. We're talking, going into social science here, which might not be something you study too much. Yes? Surveys. Surveys? Surveys? Anything other than surveys? Yeah. Surveys? <laughs> Sorry? Health readings. Health readings. Yeah, going up there, living in the community. You know, working with people who live in these communities. What about uh, oral history? Talking to grandparents, great-grandparents. What did it used to be like? This is how a lot, using a lot of the, the local knowledge. Surveys is a good one. Health sample, you know, take blood samples. Live in the community. Okay, we're done. Did it? Did it? What about earth and land? The amount of light that the ocean absorbs. That's a good point. Albedo. Yeah. How much does the land reflect? Also, the, we talked earlier about permafrost. That's the kind of thing that's coming in there. And plate tectonics, geology. This is a really big one, earth and land. It could be anything from kind of big stuff to micro stuff. Any other real questions about earth and land? Yeah? Yeah, in Antarctica, if the ice melts, what will happen if the, if the land bounces up? And, and how would you carry out research? I think we've touched on this. We'd go out there, we'd take measurements. We, you know, it's a, a fit, earth and land geologists, there's a lot of field work involved, but you also use a lot of satellites, do ground truthing. Also, maybe how you could utilize natural resources without damaging the ecosystem. Yeah, how could you utilize the natural resources without damaging the ecosystem? That's a good question. That's a big question. That's a good question. Okay, and the last one that's on here is ice. Ice. What are the questions? Why would I want to investigate ice in the polar regions? Yes. I could do some physics. Sorry. Oh, which requires friction Oh, which requires. Oh, that's a re so. The point here was ma ice is very smooth, and we could do some physics, which requires a frictionless surface. I'm liking your thinking. So we're also looking at the polar regions as, you know, we're looking for new scientific ideas. We're not just trying to look at the environmental consequences of stuff. Well, you know, what, what's up there that you don't have in other places? I like that. Yep, ice cores, looking at into the past, we'll touch on that. Oh, there's a lot here. I'm going to take you and you, and then we're going to move on. Uh, exactly. Look, using ice cores, they're a big one. And sorry, sir, behind you. Different types of ice, different structures, different chemical composition, different physics of ice, yeah. There's a lot of, to be read in an ice core. And there's one at the back, yes. Oh, 
how to, did you hear that? There's how to use the fresh water locked in the ice for people who are in areas of the world who don't have very much fresh water. Do you know, people do talk about towing icebergs. I kid you not. There's a lot of issues to do with that. But yeah, that's an interesting one. Okay, so and to do this research, you would have to go to these places. But you could also use satellites. I'm, I know I'm running to the end of my time here. I just wanted to... What I had thought I might do, but I'm not going to do it, I can do it tomorrow if you're interested, is talk a little bit about my, my science, which was, and, and where I lived. Have I got, I've got five minutes left? I thought, I, I thought I'd just show you, oh, it started without me, so you've got no choice, you're going to see it. I got on a boat, I sailed for a month from the UK down to South America, and, uh, and then we, we stopped off at some of the islands between South America and Antarctica. This was all on a, on a great big ship. It was, a, it was a fantastic experience. I really recommend to anyone to travel by surface if you possibly can, not just for carbon reasons. You get to see the whole world going past. And, and I was actually living on a moving ice shelf. It's an ice shelf which had floated off the edge of the continent. There was about 50 meters or 100 meters of ice below me where I was living. This was the base. It's an animation of the base. There's a lot of storage containers. There's the summer accommodation, that big orange thing in the middle, that was where we all lived. In the summer, there were 60 of us. In the winter, there were 18. And these are the science labs on either side, on the left and the right. And out in the distance was the lab where I worked, which is called the Clean Air Sector Laboratory, which was really far away. And the reason why it was really far away was so that we wouldn't measure our own pollution and our own emissions. And that meant I had to walk there every day, or I had to ski there, because I couldn't pollute it with a skidoo, which was a real pain, let me tell you. And uh, I just thought, just to give you a taste of what it might... Oh, man, I don't know what I'm doing here. Let's go. Okay. Uh, this is the lab where I worked. And the first year that I went down, I actually went and built this lab. And this, was, this is an aerial shot of the base where I lived. You can see the ocean in the background. That's 13 kilometers away. That's in the summer. In the winter, you can't see it at all. And, and you can see this, this is the marks of my ski tracks going from the main base down to my lab. Sorry, me and my colleague, there were two of us. That's the lab uh, looking out towards the South Pole. You can see this is really the cleanest air in the world. So for what I was doing, that was really useful. We had a whole lot of instrumentation. This was a, a really great mirror. It was a perfect retro reflector. It was actually an assembly of a collection of retro reflectors, which were put four kilometers. We built this mast. That's me on the left. You might not recognize me. It was four kilometers away from the lab. You'll like this, actually. It's cool. I don't often get to tell people about this stuff because they're like, oh, I don't want to know. But we shone a light out of the window of the lab across four kilometers of ice, hit this retro reflector, which means that it re reflects it perfectly back, right? Came back, the light came back, into the telescope, bounced it around, focused it onto an optical fiber, and then measured the concentration of particular sp atmospheric species in the air due to absorption across. So that's an eight kilometer path length, and it worked. And we took the first measurements. There's a species called uh, IO, uh, OIO, sorry, iodine with two oxygens on. It's a radical species, never been measured before in the kind of concentrations that we measured. We measured it down there. It was so exciting. We didn't think we'd measure anything. This whole thing was a, a bit of a kind of, well, we, we basically, nobody knew what was going on in the atmosphere. And so we, they developed this, this project, which I was lucky enough to go on. And we just went down there with tons of, ex, of equipment and ran them all year. And it was really hard work. And we didn't know which ones were going to work and which ones weren't. And that one was the biggest pain to set up and I, it was a real gamble and we might have measured nothing you never that's some, one of the beauties of science so you don't know which one's going to necessarily going to pull through we got some beautiful data out of this experiment but it was a, it was exciting one to build as well uh, this was another this was another laser based or light based experiment this was a, a fluorescence in, instrument that we had down there and uh, this is me pulling my kit to work some days weren't as nice as others. One of the things that I, and I, I put these photos in just because I thought you might want to see some photos. Oh, I can see your hand and I'm not going to take it, but I'll take it in a minute, I promise. Um, one of the things that I did, and I'm, I'm sneaking this in, is that quite regularly I dug big holes and took samples of um, snow at different depths. That one, actually, I'm just going to go back and show you that. That was taken at 2 o'clock in the afternoon in the winter. That's the most light we got. We waited about a week for a clear day so we'd get that amount of light. 
That's me in the top right, not that you'd know. And this was a, so this was one of the holes that we dug, and we took samples of snow at different depths. And actually for this, I then stuck some little tubes into the hole so you could see where the depths were. <clears throat> and every month I used to dig another hole. And what we were trying to do was, was follow how, how gases in the atmosphere were getting into the snow and ultimately getting into ice cores. Because the truth is, you know, people talk about ice cores holding an atmosphere, holding a slice of the time from tens of thousands of years ago. But what happened between the time that the air was in the air and the air was in the bubble? You know, there's a lot of chemical and, and physical processing that happens. It takes about 50 years in some places before that locks off. So we were trying to study those processes to understand what, what do these molecules that are in that bubble, what does that actually mean? Is that exactly the concentration that was in the air? Or, or is it some analogy? Is it a representative of, of something? So also, after, after a while, you get bubbles in ice. And I just thought you might be interested to hear this, if this works here. This is the sound of 20,000-year-old ice being brought to the surface. This is the sound of air in 20,000-year-old ice expanding and coming to the surface. I'm going to wait for that noise to finish because it's not very loud. I'm going to stand near it so my microphone catches it too. Oh, it's coming out of speakers in the sky. I'm going to go back and try this one as well. Isn't that cool? I really love that. I think I should end there. What I was going to do is then talk to you a bit about ice core science and... Um, and the data that we get out of it and, and the importance of, you, of, of de using data from the Arctic and the Antarctic that you really can't, um, can't get from anywhere else in the world. But now let me just jump through all of those slides and take you to... See, you can see I had some data and some graphs and everything I was going to take you through. I'm just going to take you back to where we were at before. And critically, because you can tell there's a lot to cover here, the middle line, which is what do I want to know, You've probably noticed I've been jumping around a bit and trying to get you work, but one of the things I was trying to, I wanted you to, re to touch upon, which you've done really far better than I expected, was to realize there's a lot of science going on in the Arctic and the Antarctic, and it covers a lot of disciplines, and you can investigate it in a lot of ways. And, you know, I, I have an hour today and I have an hour tomorrow, and it's a bit of a challenge to think, what am I going to tell them, you know? Do, do you want to talk about geography? Do you want to talk about biology? Do you want to talk about oceans, about atmosphere, about ice? So... So over the next couple of weeks, you're going to have the opportunity to talk to a number of people who have specialities in different areas. But I also want you to bear in mind for yourselves that whatever it is that you're interested in, I'm sure it has an applicability both to the polar regions and to anywhere else in the, in the Earth. And you can pursue that. But if you've got any specific things that you would like touched on tomorrow, I think I'm just going to tomorrow just take you on a whirlwind tour of some of the projects that are happening in IPY. So if you've got real burning things that you'd like to hear about, and I'm not going to be able to spend very much time on any of them, then write them on a piece of paper and leave them at the front, and I'll look at them this evening. Ding. On the, on the button.